Questions? Uh, next, we have our new directions in open access business models and open access initiatives. Uh, this session was organized by committee member Kelly Newton and will be moderated by Lauren Kane. Good morning. Thanks so much um, for, for joining us. It's great to have such a full room for this session. Um, and we want to thank the, the organizers for having us here today and a special thanks to, to Kelly Newton for um, putting this session together. Um, I think it's a great one and I think it's very timely and it fits in, I think, quite well with, um, with Rachel's talk earlier. And so what we're talking here about today is new directions in open access business models and initiatives. And we have three different expert panelists, and we welcome the Twitter storm, by the way, about our lack of gender diversity in this panel. <laughs> And we have three panelists talking from three different nonprofit organizations about what their organizations have been doing, and in some cases with limited resources uh, and, and from a nonprofit basis for quite some, some time, long before Plan S and transformational agreements were kind of in our common lexicon. And so we have Sarah Rui, Director of Strategic Partnerships at PLOS, who's speaking about the challenges of being a native OA publisher and the motivation for PLOS to kind of work beyond a traditional APC model. We have Beth Cranin, Director of Publications at the Electrochemical Society, who's talking about their work with read and publish deals long before they were in vogue. And we have Kelly Squazo, Director of Publisher Relations and Content Development at Project Muse, who will show us that we shouldn't forget about either the humanities or books when we talk about open access. <laughs> So our aim is to have this be a very thought-provoking but also very practical session since we know there's many societies who are in the room who are grappling with, with what they should do next with open access. Um, so we want you to be thinking throughout about how these ideas might apply to your organization or perhaps some other ideas that, that we aren't going to be able to cover in the panel. So we'll save questions for the end, but we very much hope that you have them um, and we will save ample time for those as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to ask Sarah to join us and get us started. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Sarah Ruhi, and I'm uh, Director of Strategic Partnerships at PLOS. I've only been there for about uh, six months, so there may be those of you in the audience who, who uh, are correcting me on some things. Um, but I'm excited today to share a bit of what we've been doing around um, new business models. And do I have to magically, I'm sorry, I, you probably explained this and I wasn't paying attention. No. There They're keeping us on our toes by having a Mac in a P, <laughs> or yeah. sorry, by having a PC in a Mac land. Yeah. There we go. Excellent. Everyone can see that? Great. And if someone else can live tweet in the meantime, because I can't do both. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the, the, I think the, the basic reality that, that PLOS is facing that I think any of the native other no, native um, OA publishers in the room can speak to is that the so-called transformative agreements or transformative models are really worlds away um, from where native OA publishers are. And the, the most obvious sort of example of this is the fact that we pioneered new business model in terms of APCs. We pioneered a new vehicle dissemination model in terms of mega journals. And now we're almost becoming victims of our own success potentially as a function of having gone first uh, in that way and then not having the advantage of being able to flip closed journals um, now. So I'm sure Subscribe to Open is going to come up in this conversation. Um, I don't know if Cameron or any of the annual reviews folks are here. Um, but that's a perfect example of something we can't do as a function of being um, a native OA publisher. So just some obvious things to call out. The content is already open. There's no world in which we would close it, um, you know, assuming that the, the business models don't work. So it's open, it stays open. Um, we don't have any um, legacy subscription pricing that we can draw on to think about what new pricing would look like in a non-APC driven model. Um, everything we ask for is new money. Um, obviously, if we're talking to our colleagues in Europe, the libraries there are much more used to being the central funnel for the funds for APC. PCs for their authors. But in the US, that's totally um, disparate. I think Rachel did a really nice job of illuminating the different um, kind of mandates depending on the regions. And so if you go to a CDL or a Gwila or a Lyricist in the US, they've never managed that money before. Are they suddenly going to create new pots of money to publish with an arm that they have never historically had to? And then of course, there's sort of no clear private benefit. I mean, I, I kind of consider this the WETA problem, if that's kind of a 
public and folks do public TV. For me, it's like every year do I give? I give if I like really like the tote bag. But if <laughs> I'm not into the tote bag this year, like I'll let my you know my my uh, subscription drop off and I'll jump in next year. And that's the challenge with this, right? The content is open. How do you get folks to pay for something that's already open? Many cases they can't. Many le many cases it's not legal to. So how do we change what the value proposition is for um, an organization that hasn't historically paid to make content open um, suddenly? Interesting. Um, so those are that's kind of where we where we stand. PLOS is in um, a sort of unique situation in terms of our uh, portfolio of journals, right? So um, 2006 was the, la the launch of one. I think that really revolutionized how we think about what publishers are willing to put out there, but also what authors really need in terms of a venue. Uh, sometimes the work just needs to get out, and sound science, solid peer review uh, should be the metric and not whether um, the research itself is going to revolutionize the field it's in. Um, PLOS Medicine and PLOS Biology tend to be our sort of broad scope journals. Uh, they launched actually first before one. They are highly selective, and the challenge that we face that Rachel um, outlined is that the APCs for those journals don't come anywhere close to paying for the cost of those journals. And in a cross-subsidy situation, that's okay. You know, we can allow the the uh, cornucopia of, of plus one revenues to cover that. But over time, and we'll talk about some of the, the evolutions of, of mega journal uh, as, as that model is matured, that becomes a problem for helping out some of the more selective journals. And then our community journals, pathogens, genetics, computational biology, and neglected tropical diseases, those are really niche. Those are really speaking to very specific communities. And in the case, for example, of neglected tropical diseases, because of the area of focus, whether it's Zika, Ebola, um, you know, very, very regionally specific um, urgent research. If a researcher can't afford to publish in that, we're going to waive the fee. So the question of waivers and what that costs an open publisher um, is a really important one to, to keep in mind as we think about these models as well. And they're all open from the beginning. So um, again, trying to put a, a barrier around them around access or cost isn't going to work. Additionally, um, PLOS just has some sort of realistic structural challenges um, that are a function of coming up with an idea first, trying to keep up with the success of that idea while still sort of being in a startup mode, and then waking up 15 years later and still realizing, holy cow, you know, we're, we, have to, we have to grow with the business that we changed. And so unsurprisingly, it's a very author-driven um, infrastructure within PLOS. We, our, our customers are individual authors. They pay micropayments, our invoicing, our accounting. All of that is structured around that kind of transaction. So to go from that to any other kind of model that engages with libraries, that engages with funders, that is looking at much bigger amounts of money coming through at you know less frequency, that's a huge change. And while it may seem that you know that's that's not a big shift internally. Many of the internal systems you need to do that in an ac accurate, predictable way. Um, we're still figuring out a plot, so that's a particular challenge um, that's unique to us. And then in terms of challenges to the business, um, I mentioned the sort of evolution of mega journals, and I, I think Scholarly Kitchen had an article maybe a month ago or so about the, the, the I don't know, decline, was the word decline used of mega journals? That we've certainly seen a drop in submissions. Um, it's definitely, ooh. <laughs> It's not beeps now, it's like alien um, zaps. That's the sound of the decline. Okay, that's the decline in Mega Journal. Um, so, you know, plus one, when it was the only one, uh, was a really awesome uh, product to be sitting on. And, and we demonstrated that it worked. Many others have jumped on board with other excellent um, offerings. And now there's just, there's, despite the explosion in articles, there's not enough to go around. So we've seen that decline. Um, the challenges that one had, you know, almost 10 years ago have still lingered in terms of impressions around the quality of work that, that one publishes. And so while the quality is high and we've put in a lot of checks to mitigate for, um, you know, some dropped balls that happened a decade ago, we're still dealing with the repercussions of that and the, um, the impact that it has on mega journals in general in terms of thinking that, you know, they produce quality research. So that's something we're still dealing with. Um, in terms of uh, selectivity, there's really no great way to with APCs to pay for selectivity. And the challenge we're having is particularly around PLOS medicine. In the medicine space, there really is no top tier medicine journal that's OA, fully OA, other than PLOS. And the intention of that journal was, you know, if you're a clinician working in, you know, 
an office and you've never had, you don't have access to a subscription a journal, you should at least have one top tier journal that you can just go and access as just a regular working doctor without access to a university library to inform your, for, to inform your practice. And if, um, you know, if, if plus medicine weren't there, you'd, you'd have very expect, expensive subscription journals as the only option. And so finding a way to make plus medicine pay to serve a very specific audience, the other piece of medicine that's different is we really focus a lot on public health and public policy, which is something that the competitors don't. So how do we make that um, at least cover its costs, uh, if not uh, bring a little extra in? And then lastly, um, the waivers component is a real challenge. I mean, from day one, PLOS was always committed to ensuring that if you couldn't publish, you should be able to you know, demonstrate need, for lack of a better word, and get your fees waived. And we have two different programs that do this. But um, as Cameron Name mentioned at ALPSP, and I agree with this, A, you know, nobody wants to ask for a, a handout to, to be able to publish. Many of the regions that can afford to publish are the ones who most urgently need their work made available from day one. Um, early career researchers just getting started. The, the someone spoke over here about their um, their their uh, tenure and promotion committee telling them you know where you need to publish to, to to get tenure. They're just trying to get that next grant to keep the project going. Um, they may not have the money to publish, and then they're just you know social sciences and humanities, which we're going to talk about. That is not. The, the pay to publish paradigm doesn't exist for them. So how do we, um, in the near term, allow those communities to still participate in this while also um, being financially sustainable? And waivers on the part of PLOS have certainly ballooned to the point that we've really had to think about seriously scaling them back. And um, we run the risk of, in the, to, to get to a, a paradigm where we don't have to charge APCs, in the near term basically saying to those folks who need, need waivers, we can't support you. And that's not a place we want to be. So that's a big challenge we're facing right now as well. Um, so we're fundamentally committed to, it doesn't matter your discipline, it doesn't matter where you're from, and it doesn't matter where you are in your career, you should be able to publish. What happens when APCs become a barrier to that? And we say that you know as one of the first publishers to, to use them, but the concern about I think the concern with Plan S and a lot of these these different mandates out there is gold really seems like a safe option to quickly become compliant, right? And if that becomes the end point and not the transitional point to get us to something else, we've actually just eliminated a, uh, we, we've made reading open and we've made publishing closed. And that is from the, pop, the PLOS missions perspective, that's just not an acceptable end point for us. In addition to the fact that we, we also need to, to find um, ways to, uh, to offset some of the losses of one and the cost of selectivity for some of our journals. So where do we want to go? We really want to see a mixed economy where APCs still, still play a part, but we're also able to um, pull more stakeholders in to sharing the costs so that these models can be sustainable and where we can, we can not have authors paying an APC. So that future could be completely APC free, it could be mixed, but we don't, where we are now of APCs being our predominant re revenue source, we need to get away from that. We want to get away from that. So we're looking at sort of three distinct models. Um, the first is, you know, this isn't, you know, revolutionary by any means, but it's a, tr it's a big transition for us getting away from kind of micropayments, is how can we bundle APCs in such a way that the friction between the author and publishing is gone, the, en the engagement is entirely with either a consortium or a funder, and when the author goes through the uh, submission process, uh, the system sort of recognizes them and hopefully says, you don't have an APC as a function of your relationship to this consortium or this funder, and the author can go through. What's really interesting about this model, for those of you who are having conversations with CDL or, or looking at the models that they've, they've had, um, it's absolutely reflective of CDL's immense privilege that they're actually doing the opposite, right? They want to um, actually produce a moment of friction for the author where the author actually has to think about the APC cost, and then hopefully that will drive some price sensitivity around where authors publish. That's, that, that's the hope of that model, and that's one model that we're, we're, we're trying to accommodate. But in most cases, we would like to eliminate that friction rather than introduce it. Um, so that is the sort of, I guess, least transformative of the models, but a big step for PLOS to move away from um, these individual micropayments. The next model that we're looking at that's a little bit more exciting, a little bit more scary, um, definitely uh, new for us, is something that we're, we're basically calling a collection act. 
a collective action model. Um, and this is the challenge you have when you can't do subscribe to open, right? The, I think the brilliance of that model was if everybody's in, we'll make the content open. When everybody's not in, we close it. And you know, given the paradigm, it feels very fair. In this particular case, we can't, we can't, we're not going to close anything. So what sets of private benefits and sort of collective benefits need to be in place for um, stakeholders, funders, institutions, um, and other other institutions that may not fall into those two buckets. Uh, what, what collective benefits need to be in place for them to say, we will contribute to this, even if we never publish in MED, even if we only read in MED, even if we don't publish or read in MED, can we find a way to demonstrate a collective value to get institutions to contribute? And that is a, um, it's a thorny yarn bundle to unpick, if I may use a terrible metaphor. We're, we're, we're figuring it out, but it's, it's a challenge. But these two journals cost so much that it's, it's really important to, to figure out a way that to at least make them break even. Um, and then lastly is transition models. Um, what can we do in the near term to buy us time while we get to models that are more sustainable over the long term? And so we're looking at you know, partnerships with funders. We're looking at partnerships with other publishers. And can you know, please consider this an open call to anyone in the room here that wants to have a discussion around this. Um, we basically we don't want to reinvent the wheel, I guess, is the thing. You know, if we're doing something that's working, you're trying to build something on your side that's that you're having trouble with, like, let's just, let's try to pool resources if we can where it makes sense rather than um, doing our, our own separate things. So that's that's sort of how we're looking at it. Per, the particular example I'll give is um, the Eiffel Consortium of Libraries. Are folks familiar with Eiffel? They're a consortium of 38 um, national uh, country consortia representing, I hate to use, I'm, I'm not a fan, I'm getting rid of Global South, I'm not going to use that anymore. It represents countries in Latin America, Africa, Eastern Europe, and Southeast Asia. And basically, they're, there's probably folks in here who've talked with them, they want to get all of their um, authors to just publish APC free. And they've been going, you know, to the big five, and they, they've been saying, yeah, of course, you know, we'll waive your fees, you'll waive your fees. Then they come to BLOSS, and they're like, oh, you'll waive our fees, right? I'm like, can't waive your fees. <laughs> like, I've done the math. I cannot waive your fees. Um, and so the, they were like, well, is the conversation over? And I was like, I don't want it to be over. I mean, I don't want to walk away from this many libraries. These are the folks we, we absolutely want to cater to as a publisher. And so we're actually trying to work out something with Gates to see if we can... Um, somehow establish a bridge fund over the next couple of years that will help cover some of those costs while we establish more sustainable models such that at the end of that period, those libraries won't have to pay APCs regardless. So that's one sort of kind of workaround that is a near-term fix. Uh, we can't leave any funder on the hook indefinitely, uh, but that's the goal with that kind of third um, model. So I don't know how I am on time, but I will stop, and um, thanks for your time. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as Lauren mentioned, my name is Beth Cronin, and I'm from the Electrochemical Society. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the things that we've done um, over the last couple of years that are actually part of what you would consider transformative agreements and just some of the success that we've had along the ways and just some of the things that, you know, we need to consider for the future. Um, if you don't know a little bit about us, um, we were founded in 1902 um, as a professional society to support the electrochemical um, physical sciences area. Um, in 1930, we started as the American Electrochemical Society, and in 1930, we dropped the American, um, which was forward thinking in, back in that, those days. These are just some of the individuals that were part of the early parts of our uh, organization. From a publishing standpoint, um, we p currently publish two journals uh, within our portfolio. Uh, the Journal of the Electrochemical Society has been published in some form or fashion since 1902. Uh, that's our flag flagship journal. And in essence, that's really kind of um, where we get a lot, most of our submissions um, in terms of our publishing. In 19, 
or excuse me, in 2012, 1912, um, we broke off the solid state science um, and started the ECS Journal of Solid State Science and Technology. Um, and, you know, essentially in our publishing, you know, this is really what our two um, journals are modeled after as I talk and go into a little bit more about our read and publish. So, we, in 19, excuse me, in 2016, we launched uh, ECS Plus, which today we call our read and publish model. Back then when we started and launched this particular program, in essence, we were considering it part of our subscription model. Um, you know, we currently have our subscription model based as a tiered system with FTEs. And one of the ways that we were able to do this, being a small nonprofit and having a, size, a staff of one person that did our subscription sales, essentially that we made it simple and transparent, that essentially, a library could look up the prices and, and know that they could upgrade to ECS Plus um, and get the access to all of the content uh, within, you know, ECS Digital Library. Um, and then the part of the read and publish for us essentially was about making APCs unlimited. And that, you know, how we did that is that back when we launched our open access publishing, we never really based a business model off of APCs within our organization. Um, and I gave a talk back in uh, San Diego at the SSB annual conference, and one of the questions that was asked of me is, well, how are you paying for it? In essence, we're paying for it through our subscription model, um, and it's pretty simplistic um, when it comes down to it. So where we started with this is that in 2013, our board of directors approved our open access publishing. At that point, we probably didn't really know where we were going to go with this. We also formed at that time a committee to look at the free dissemination of content. If you know a little bit about electrochemical and solid state science, um, you know, we're the science of sustainability. So everything that's happening around climate change, the carbon footprint, the energy storage, um, all of those challenges are based in our science. And at the end of the day, as a mission-based organization, our goal is to help that pace of innovation um, faster. So we formed this uh, committee and they looked at, um, you know, what that meant for the organization. And we, in order to begin the whole open access publishing, we began to, uh, through a hybrid model of our current journals. So we set our APC pretty standardly low um, when you look at the other publishers in our space and other journals. And we actually, to kickstart the program, we actually gave waivers away to our meeting attendees and individuals from any subscribing institution back in 2014. Um, we also incorporated um, waivers or article credits within our membership and institutional membership programs. So, you know, that was kind of the start of um, our open access publishing. Um, and, you know, it kind of took off based on, uh, you know, individuals making decisions and whether or not they wanted to publish. And it had a slow uptick um, in the beginning for us. Uh, as we moved down the pike, we um, also started beginning to do other initiatives that, you know, in a lot of ways were very bold. Um, you know, we want to get to an open access um, environment, which is really more platinum. Um, and we started creating uh, opportunities for our research communities to experience what that could mean to them. So in 2015 was the first year that by celebrating Open Access Week, we actually took down our paywall for an entire week. Um, to give the world uh, access to our content. And while probably, um, you know, it, we definitely see content spike and the usage spike those weeks, um, you know, essentially, you know, we want to be able that, we know that there are labs and research communities that currently don't have access to our content that take advantage of those weeks even to this day. Um, moving into 2016, um, you may have heard of Free the Science. It's, it's our vision and where we want to go um, as an organization to move to a platinum environment. And in essence, um, and I, you know, I think Sarah talked a little bit about you know, that environment where authors don't have to pay and readers don't have to pay to read. You know, the goal is for us to you know, have that money go back into the science. Um, and it's a huge business model changing because how do you pay for um, something that is pretty costly in terms of publishing operations? Um, in the same year, we also launched um, what is our read and publish model, ECS Plus. 
Um, and in essence, um, you know, we were able to land a uh, consortia deal with China and NSTL that really drove this uh, respective uh, program for us. We had a number of institutions that you know are all in the forefront of open access publishing also commit to this program, and we really, in the first year in 2016, um, finished the year with about 922 institutional subscribers. So for us, that was pretty successful in the scope of things. Um, we also began um, allowing and, and waiving article credits around our focus issues. You know, this is the content that we develop that's in focus topics. Um, and a lot of the content that we develop is also in honor of the community and the network that we have built uh, within ECS. Um, and we um, implemented um, copyright clearance centers of rights link for authors to help us manage these uh, collections and waivers programs. And in a way that, you know, I only, I'm the director of publications and I have a staff of six that, that handle all of the operations and, and any aspect of what you would consider uh, most publishers do. So, you know, that was really important for us to be able to manage and, you know, hold up the expectations both from our ECS Plus program, our membership programs, um, and so on. And in 2017, we launched Free the Science Week. So in essence of what we do for Open Access Week, in April, in relation to our founding, we launched that week to also bring down the paywall and say, this is what we believe Free the Science should be um, to our research community. We grew in 2017 to 998 uh, institutional subscribers um, and continued that growth in 2018. And we actually did explore also a collective action program. Um, and you know, for us, collective action um, is a way f that we could consider free the science in, in meeting some of those goals. We originally thought of it as it could be a transitional model for us before we get to platinum up and open access. But in essence, um, we weren't in the position that we felt that we wanted to be a pioneer in regards to the library community because at the end of the day, you know, in terms of I think it needs a little bit more support on the sales and subscription and that aspect. Um, to be successful. And uh, like PLOS was considering, you know, you do need a carrot um, for the libraries to commit to this. Um, and, you know, fundamentally, I don't think we had gotten to the place where we felt comfortable, where we wanted to say, yes, uh, we hit the 85% of libraries who committed to this as a collective and that we're going to open the content. But I do think that model is um, something that should be considered in the future. Um, and as you're looking at models, um, it's something that I think from a library um, community, I think may be more interested in, in now than it, when we started this discussion. Because when we modeled this collective action, essentially plan S and these discussions weren't happening. So fast forward, you know, we're at the end of 2019, a lot has changed in the discussions uh, within the last year or so. Um, and you know, I think like PLOS is in the same position, we are too as well, that you know, we have to consider how do we get to free the science. Um, and the goal for us was to create a fund that we could help um, you know, use some of the endowment or the uh, interest on to pay for the operational costs. Um, for so you know in the next couple of years we have to consider how we to, how do we continue to um, increase that endowment um, while also continuing to um, move our publications forward. Um, I'm happy to say that we actually grew to over 1,200 subscribers this year alone in our read and publish model. And, you know, I think one librarian, I remember her coming up to me at Charleston Conference one day and just said to me, it's just a no-brainer. And in essence, for the libraries and authors, it really is um, in the way we've modeled it in terms of, um, you know, them buying into it. Because we originally went to launch this as, you know, in opposition of the double dipping because we do have um, high uh, model currently with both of our journals. Now beyond 2019, we've actually uh, moved into a partnership with IOP Publishing and you know that's kind of what our model will look like in the future and working with them um, and continuing to work where we want to go um, that's you know yet to be written. But I think there's a lot of opportunity out there with the models that you know have been presented just recently. Now, 
In our open access um, credit program, you know, waivers definitely is a big part of our community as well. Um, we uh, give currently ECS members one waiver a year um, and a huge uh, discount um, for publishing open access with us. We, again, also waive our article um, processing charges for focus issues and then ECS Plus um, where we give unlimited waivers for individuals from those institutions. You know, we're also in the position right now to decide whether or not we want to pull back on some of the waiver programs for various reasons um, because at the end of the day, ECS Plus or that type of transformative agreement is where we want to the bulk of um, people making the decisions around open access and why they publish open access with us for. You know, I think the one thing that's kind of come up um, also in discussions recently were around um, the fact that it's not a one size fits all in these models. Um, when we launched Free the Science, you can in essence say that we've taken multiple tactics since 2016 in various ways. Um, you know, again, our goal is to get to a platinum environment. Um, so if that's really what Free the Science is all about for us. But in, in essence, we also have published, I would believe at the end of 2018, over 37% of our content published since 2014 is open access. So in some ways, Free the Science has been uh, categorized as a crowdfunding, but it's actually really more than that for us as well, too. Um, but we are using our community to look for donations and to support that from a financial standpoint. So one of the goals for us is to really get to you know that open environment. We also do have a pretty um, open, uh, green, open access. We have no embargo on our current uh, green open access policy uh, where authors can submit their accepted manuscripts. Um, and, you know, again, wherever this transformative agreement or where these models land by the time that 2014 rolls around, you know, Freedom Publish has been a pretty successful aspect for us uh, along the way to, you know, get to where we want to be. Um, I will say one of the biggest challenges that we've had along the way with the Read and Publish is just around the author understanding that they're part of the program. You know, we are challenged in communicating with those individuals because right now those programs, those, the libraries are the ones that are committing to that program and you don't know if they're communicating. You know, one of the aspects with China is that we don't really have direct communication with them other than WeChat or getting that information out there. So, you know, we can't say to the authors that, you know, essentially you're part of uh, this program and that we want them to take advantage of it. At the end of the day, we built our business model around this more read and publish and the subscription aspect. And, you know, we, we are pro people deciding to publish open access. We also did um, a market research study last year um, around uh, why people choose to publish open access. And I will tell you, um, as uh, even in alignment with this morning's keynote, is that our community told us that it's essentially based on funders um, requiring it or employers requiring it or a colleague, which then you can probably correlate to the first item. So, you know, in essence, you know, we have our, you know, tried and true uh, pro open access uh, publishers uh, or authors excuse me, but in the, at the end of the day, until I think the community is, um, you know, not forced to, but having to in some way, shape, or form, whether it's a funder requirement or employer requirement, in essence, I think there's still that, you know, short upswing of people choosing to publish open access. Now, a, a more recent um, positive thing that has happened for us is that oh, we just published an article related to Tesla uh, about a month ago. If you're following Elon Musk and his um, essentially, you know, in April he put out there saying that they're going to uh, have pretty soon a million mile battery. Well, we published that paper a month ago. I will tell you that it's open access and I'm thankful it's open access because it's received over 20,000 downloads and that's pretty substantial for us within one month. On average, our articles get about, maybe our highest article gets about 1,000 to 1,500 downloads. So if that wasn't open access, that would be behind closed doors and that, you know, communities couldn't have the ability to, to see that science. So, um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about us and uh, happy to take questions later on.
Hello, good morning, we're almost to lunch. <laughs> um, as Lauren mentioned, I'm Kelly Squazzo. I'm the Director of Publisher Relations and Content Development at Project Muse, which is part of Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, we're a digital aggregator of nonprofit scholarly journals and books, and we're actually getting ready to celebrate our 25th anniversary next year. So I'm really excited to talk about books. I've been in book publishing my entire career, so it's awesome to be able to talk about the university press world. And you know, we're a little tiny portion of this of this ecosystem, but we are we do have our successes and challenges in finding our own kind of voice in the OA space. Um, I also want to talk about Project Muse's role as an aggregator in supporting these nonprofit publishers and then establishing best practices um, for a sustainable open access business model for monographs. Oh, and because I work with many publishers in my role at Muse, I'm going to talk about a variety of projects that are outside of Hopkins and Muse as well as what's going on in my home base. Let's see if I can get this to work. Great. So I think we probably all know the core of um, humanities and social science publishing is the mission. We're a very mission-driven business model. Um, we want to connect authors and readers to ensure maximum visibility of content and discoverability, and we really want that to be a part of a larger scholarly communication system. But we're really grappling with that careful balance of participating in this world and then finding the resources and the money to actually be able to publish high quality peer reviewed OA manuscripts. Um, it's well known that humanities and social science content uh, sales are declining, they're constantly declining, um, but it still costs the same amount of money to publish these books. Um, many are rejected each year, each press has a set number of titles they can publish each season, and then we all know that gaining tenure in humanities is still tied to publishing that monograph at a peer-reviewed um, university press during your time as an assistant professor. I don't think any of that's going to change anytime soon, but people are still talking about that and we really want that to change. Um, if you haven't seen Digital Sciences report that came out this summer, it was called The State of the Open Monograph. Um, it really did take a deep dive into these challenges. I really suggest checking that out. It's a really good summary of that. So the big question that I'm always looking to explore is how can university presses integrate OA monographs into this digital information system when publication models are still very much print-centric? So there are a lot of initiatives happening in the nonprofit world um, that are attempting to address this issue, and I'll just mention a couple of them that are really um, interesting to me. Uh, the Sustainable History Monograph pi pi Pilot, um, it's a Mellon-funded initiative to publish open digital editions of high-quality books in the area of history um, from university presses. So it's a partnership between UNC Press and Longleaf Services, which is a, a publishing services arm owned by UNC Press. So over 20 uh, presses have signed up to participate so far, and they're hoping to have their first books come out next year. What's really interesting about this project is it aims to put together some standards. There's very little standardization in the OA monograph publishing world. Um, so using templates for book layout and covers to save on costs and requiring authors to get matching subventions from their universities. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how one subject matter performs in, uh, in this, uh, this discipline of, of history. Um, they're going to look at how readers are engaging with these open monographs, and then also they're going to have what they're calling the control books that are published along with their, their, usual, um, in their usual gated format to see how readers are engaging with both. So it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Um, Project Muse will be one of the aggregators hosting these books, um, and we're looking forward to um, helping with this project to establish best practices, and we're trying to teach our publishers the importance of accurate metadata, um, encouraging book authors to use ORCID IDs and seeing how that plays out, um, and then the role of usage statistics and kind of shaping uh, the, uh, the success and moving forward. Um, another project that you may have heard of in the university press world is Tome, Toward an Open Monograph Ecosystem, which launched in the spring of 2017. So it's a collaboration of three organizations, the Association of, of American Universities, the Association of Research Libraries, and the Association of University Presses. So it's looking to advance the wide distribution of scholarship in humanities and social sciences. 
Um, over 60 university uh, presses are participating so far, so it's a rather large project. And there's three components that are a part of this. Um, the baseline university funding grant of $15,000 is required to support the publication of an open access monograph. It's kind of what it costs to do that. <laughs> um, a set target of awarding at least three publication grants per year, and then a commitment to funding the initiative for five years. So it's going to be going on for a little bit of time now. Um, I think the university funding grants are sending a nice uh, message to faculty in humanities and social sciences that their scholarship is really important and that we want to publish it and promote their scholarship. And it also is an opportunity to open doors for university presses that just don't have that uh, that funds and, and looking at the affordability to publish um, and, and do some innovation in digital humanities. So that'll be really interesting. Um, Project Muse actually launched a SUNY Press's first book from the Tome initiative uh, this past summer. So back at home, um, at, like I said, I'm at Johns Hopkins University Press and Project Muse is part of that. Um, so the press side of the house has been um, doing two in OA initiatives so far. The first one is under, well, it's all under the open um, overarching program of Hopkins Open Publishing. Um, HOP is what they're calling it. Um, so the first was a low risk experiment to determine the effects of opening up 100 books um, and see what the engagement and sales were on Project Muse. Um, so they selected 100 key out of print books, um, basically republished them. Um, and then they monitored their behavior. And it was really interesting because of the 100 titles, about 50 of them had already been on Project Muse as gated books. Um, and they experienced an average of three times more engagement per month when compared with the time period when they were gated on Muse. So that was really awesome to get these kind of older backlist um, books to have more eyeballs on them. Um, there was an overall decline in sales, not surprisingly, of about one copy per, per title, so not too alarming, especially for deep backlist titles. And sales revenue actually increased by $900. Obviously, these are very small numbers, but what was really good about it is it kind of assuaged the fears of acquisitions editors to open up their content and worry about sales. And kind of, you know, just to kind of give them peace of mind that sales would not decrease appreciably if we opened up some backlist content. Um, so the current project Hopkins is working on, we're calling it the Encore Editions. Um, so we're opening up uh, 20 classic um, books in humanities, um, Back to Life as OA, and Print on Demand, which is another piece of the model that they always offer with a buy button for print. Um, it's part of the Humanities Open Book Program. It's a joint sponsored program from NEH and the Mellon Foundation. And we're going to be um, launching those books during Open Access Week um, later this month. Just as a side note, um, Clearing the rights for 200 books that have been out of print for a while was a huge effort. Our editorial assistant was a major rock star, so that was a really good best practice for business models moving forward to make sure you have the resources and the time for that sort of editorial work. It was a lot. <laughs> um, so I do want to talk a little bit about Project Muse and Muse Open. Um, as I mentioned before, Project Muse is a digital aggregator. Um, we have about 125 presses that work for, with us. And we're unique in the fact that we're, we are a nonprofit, and we only work with nonprofit publishers. So for our gated content, we're able to give that shared revenue back into the nonprofit ecosystem. So Muse Open um, was our Mellon-funded initiative for hosting open access monographs. And we, we launched that, I think it was like last summer. I've only been with Project Muse for about a year. So I came on board, and we launched this huge initiative. Um, so about 25% of our publishers actually are com uh, contributing OA content to Project Muse, and we're growing. So I just want to highlight a few of the aspects of our um, business model. Um, our grant allowed us to completely redesign our platform, which was amazing because now that um, everyone uses everything on their iPhones, people actually have that really good user experience. Um, OA content appears in the same search uh, results as our gated content, so users have a seamless experience. Um, and we receive the same treatment as gated content for discoverability, preservation, and analytics. Um, so I work in publisher relations, and um, our publishers have a really great feedback for us on our streamlined submission process. So we take EPUB files, and we convert them to HTML, and we launch them on the platform within four weeks. So we're able to get this stuff into Muse very quickly. 
Um, and a key component of our business model um, is our usage statistics tool. Engagement and measuring engagement is core to this business model. Um, and publishers can look at OA patterns alongside gated patterns, <coughs> excuse me, um, to, to grow into, I can't use the water, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're really excited about our usage statistics tool and the fact that um, we can look at gated content and see how it performs with open access. Um, lastly, I should probably mention the kind of the bad part of our business model, which are the hosting fees. Um, we obviously want to be good citizens of the world um, and support the mission to make scholarly content available, but we have real costs for producing these books and launching them on Project Muse just like we do for our gated content. Um, in the industry, there's very little standardization about book processing charges, and then there's really nothing about book hosting charges. So when we launched Muse Open, um, we decided to waive our one time per title $100 fee uh, through the end of 2019. So this gave our publishers an opportunity to submit as much content as possible to Project Muse without incurring a fee. Um, it's important for us to and our business model to ensure publishers understand the value of Project Muse, and that is why we keep our fee as low as possible. It's really solely to offset ingestion and conversion costs. It doesn't, at, by any chance, co cover all of it. Um, and I think the majority of our publishers understand that publishing in OA is far from cost-free, and we haven't received any negative feedback about our fee so far. Um, we also encourage our publishers to build in the fee to their grant uh, publishing requests. So as I work with a lot of university press authors in my role at Project Muse, it really becomes apparent how important it is to establish universal best practices for publishers and aggregators for a sustainable OA model. Um, these are just some of the, the best practices that I see from an aggregator's perspective. So I'll just point out a few of them. Um, Obviously, a streamlined development and production process is really important to reduce overall spending and getting uh, speed to publication for impact. Um, Choosing an aggregator with similar uh, benefits and mission, I think, is important. Someone like Project Muse. Um, we work with our libraries. We know the library market really well. We produce mark records to make putting open access books into their systems very easily. I can't underestimate the importance of downstream activities such as preservation and archiving. It's not a host it and done situation. There's a lot of care that goes into taking um, taking care of this content, and Project Muse is able to do something like that. And I'm always talking to my authors, uh, I'm sorry, to my publishers about how to measure their impact. So utilizing our usage statistics tool, getting to know analytics, understanding pivot tables, and how to look at things so that they can also take that back to their editorial team, talk to their authors, and show evidence for what kind of content is, more, is, is going to be new and exciting in humanities and social sciences. So just to wrap up, um, what really excites us as an aggregator um, in our business model is the opportunity to work with publishers to experiment with content formats. So now that we're, we're outside of the constraints of the PDF and working in HTML, um, we can really work with media-rich projects that can make better connections to other content. Um, we have the capacity to host digital-first works on our platform. We have an experienced content development team that wants to work with publishers to put really new, innovative um, humanities and social science projects out into the open access world. So that's what we'd like to do, and I appreciate you listening to me. Thank you. <laughs> Well, first, I just want to really thank our speakers. Um, you know, I think what's really useful is that you've talked about a lot about what, what has worked, but you've also all touched on what hasn't worked. And I think especially for the societies in the room that may be feeling overwhelmed with how many options are out there, it's a case where it's really useful to hear about how the sausage is made. And as a vegetarian, it's a metaphor I typically hate, uh, but I actually think it's really apropos here because this is messy. And some Sometimes when you hear about how much work has gone in, you don't really want the final product. <laughs> but I think that this is a case where, you know, we need to be transparent about this. We need to be listening and having conversations uh, as part of panels and sessions like this. But we also need to be talking amongst ourselves, amongst different societies, about what is working and what isn't working 
uh, so that we can kind of move things forward collectively. So we welcome your questions, but we also welcome uh, your input about what is working and what is not at your respective organizations. So who would like to get us started? Hi, Lisa Hinchliffe at the University of Illinois. I am very curious, um, it, uh, this will primarily be for uh, Beth about the Electrochemical Society, but one of the things that we definitely have heard a lot of critique of in Plan S, for example, but in other c sectors as well, right, is the critique of the hybrid journal. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, it seems like you have a success story here with hybrid. And so I'm wondering, um, is there, um, is this a lack of good communication about the way the hybrid process is a sustainable model for transition? Or are you just a special snowflake um, case and the general critiques are actually, you know, maybe actually have a little bit more sustenance to them than one might think? Well, I think for a while we were like the best kept secret for for in terms of our model um, because I think up until this year this is the first year that I've started talking publicly about it so I think there wasn't a lot of knowledge in the academic publishing industry about the respective model um, you know again our goal we took a proactive stance we, we went out and said, we want to free the science, and then people looked at us in 2016 like, you guys are crazy, right? You want to give, how are you going to pay for that? Um, so our long-term goal is not, wasn't to keep hybrid model. It, it was a transitional thing for us until we potentially can get there, until our goal to get there. And we still are on that trajectory um, to move to more platinum. Now, I, you know, in terms of the environment, um, in in that, like, it is actually a success, success story of how, you know, um, a hybrid can be open and, and not double dip and, and go down that path. Um, but in essence, you know, our goal still is to get to the, away from a hybrid perspective. Um, you know, we could get even, in my mind, I think collective action could be a free the science in, in certain aspects because we always said free for authors to publish with us and free for readers to read, but we never really said free for libraries, um, in essence, on that aspect. Um, but, you know, um, the goal is to, you know, make it free. And at some point in time, you know, we have to decide whether or not this could be still accepted. I mean, I think it's where, um, where the dust settles down the road of what's going to be accepted from, you know, a library standpoint and, and the funding standpoint um, as a model. And right now, they're saying that that it won't be accepted long term. So maybe it is like, hey, this is what we're doing, and you know, maybe this could be, you know, maybe the conversation will change six months from now. But again, it all depends on where I think the libraries are going to be accepting of, of that and what role they play um, beyond subscriptions. So hope that answered your question. Hi, I was interested in asking Kelly whether you had any numbers. Uh, you mentioned print on demand for open access books uh, in the humanities. As I understand other people who've tried this, um, they get really quite good numbers from print on demand. So people are reading enough of the book online to realize they'd like it, but no one wants to read a monograph on an iPhone no matter how good your responsive is. <laughs> so they actually were getting good results from that. And I wondered if you had any stats yet to support that. I, can yell. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a lot of statistics on that. Not all of our publishers on Project Muse actually take advantage of using the buy button. Uh, for, for Johns Hopkins University Press, it's very minimal, <laughs> honestly. Um, I think... It's something that we do because there's that worry that the sales are going to continue to, to decline. So it's that peace of mind. Um, but we haven't seen a huge spike in it. Um, the the, the uh, Encore editions, the 200, that's something that we're, we're actually keeping stock of print books on that with a spe special cover. And we're going to be tracking that. So we'll have some statistics on that 
but I, it hasn't been huge. <laughs> it's a great question. I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, can you? Here we go. Uh, yeah, this message, this uh, question is also for you, Kelly. Um, along with the open access monograph um, programs, have you been experimenting with open peer review of monographs as well? And the press has not been doing that, no. Um, so Muse, Project Muse is an aggregator, so we, we're a little arm's length with our presses on that, but we do require them, all, everything on our site, to have peer review. But uh, as far as I know, Johns Hopkins Press has not experimented with that yet. Hi, Scott Deneen from the Optical Society. This question is primarily for Sarah. It was really interesting to hear what flipping to open means for a big open access journal like PLOS, the PLOS journals. And my question is, as you're dealing with libraries, are they looking for new metrics? Are they going to be looking at a cost per download for open access? That's a fascinating question. So we've, um, we're talking to, if, if, via consortia, um, probably almost 3,000 libraries right now. And <laughs> it's so funny how many of them ask for usage statistics, right? And you're sitting there going, but it's open, you know? And, and classic cha challenge of PLOS, right? When we started, like, it's open, we, we don't track usage statistics. So we've never tracked usage statistics. The way I have to do it now, we'll work, Anne's, Anne's gonna fix that. Um, the way we do it now is, is painful and I won't subject any of you to it, um, to the details of it, but um, that is something that we're gonna move on pretty quickly because it's gonna be a critical component to making the read case for why an art organization should still contribute to open access content when they're not paying for it. So if we can demonstrate that your usage indicates that you're seeing value, and you can think of many institutions that would fall into that, right? You're not publishing in PLOS Medicine every day, but you're reading it all the time. There should be some sort of c contribution that spreads that cost such that not only the research-heavy institutions are paying. So the, the usage metrics come from the libraries, I think, largely as like a knee-jerk reaction. We just always want to see those. Price per use has never come up. But really, on our side, the big realization is we need that. We need some proxy of usage to, to make the read case to think about price. Um, other metrics that... Um, the libraries are focused on, you know, is really number of corresponding authors publishing um, in your in your journals. And one of the interesting kind of digressions from that that we're looking at, we're also looking at contributing authors because your corresponding author list could be relatively small for a really selective journal like PLOS Medicine. But when you add the really long tail of contributing authors, that's another proxy for reading or another form of engagement that clearly is valuable and thus has should, should be contributed for in some way. Yeah, thanks. I want to observe, too, that with these read and publish deals, there's a lot more information being requested of publishers and going back and forth. So we definitely all need to be prepared for that. Yeah, and I think we should be sharing because, I mean, it's every, every phone call is like, oh, and that's another thing we need to do. And that's another, you know, the list gets longer and longer. Um, and, and for PLOS, what we have to ask ourselves is what can we deliver now? What can we take the 12 months to figure out and what is going to take longer than that to move forward. There's got to be a, a sort of um, iterative process there. I think there's a question from Angela. It's kind of a follow-up. So um, one, of the, one of the questions I've been asking is if open access publications are going to be changing models either through read and publish arrangements or um, this collective action, which has been new to me today, so that's been exciting to hear about, um, where libraries or institutions are paying for the open access. You know, I've been questioning at what point will libraries and librarians start requiring that open access journals do all the things that subscription journals do, such as counter compliance statistics, and sounds like that's coming from PLOS, which is great. Um, but the, you know, the other thing is that um, 
you will, you're changing the dynamic in that model whereby it benefits you, PLOS, to have all of the usage of your content on your own platform, which is inherently in conflict to the, we don't care where papers appear because they're open access under CC BY. They can be posted anywhere because we don't care about usage. So now that you may need to actually care about usage, how does that flip the dynamic of the model? Oh, I have a rebuttal for you on that one. Okay. <laughs> Things are getting we good, people. We've done a great job of syndicating our stuff because we thought, you know, it's open. People will find it. So we actually, historically, you will not find plot stuff indexed in the places it really should be indexed. So that's another sort of subscription behavior we're going to have to take on because it's it's just a glaring sort of gap in, in the way we... we produce our content sort of post-acceptance. Um, it's a really good point. I I don't know. I don't <laughs> know. I mean, at, at this point, I would be happy if anything counted anything. So the, 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 the bar is really low <laughs> for me. Anne's a better person to answer okay. that question. So, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just taking a stab at that, I think it's pretty safe to say that nothing's going to change the inherent parts of our DNA that are about open and research, even if sometimes that means that it would be benefit us to do something in a different way, but it goes counter to our mission. So unfortunately, I guess for us, and maybe good for other people, I don't see that changing. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll, we'll just always say that our numbers are slightly under and under counted because we, we can't all count say that, Sarah. For all that, all that use. All we don't say know. that. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> can, I, can I just say, um, I'm Heather Staines, I'm on the counter board, and one of the things that's coming imminently is the distributed usage logging, which actually will enable publishers and anyone who has content in multiple locations to actually be able to roll that up. So it's, I don't think it's necessarily as much of a conflict as it might immediately appear to be, so. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this might be more of a statement as opposed to a question, um, but the Amy Pulaski from Ohio Link. So I can actually talk about consortia and what we do and what we need and what our libraries need. And those statistic numbers are important because they have to justify the use of those funds in many, many ways. And not just within the library, but to provosts or university presidents to try to make the case to participate in something like that. Um, and um, Sarah, I wanted to po point out at Ohio Link, we have three deals, uh, um, I'm slightly embarrassed to admit that we do this, but we do it and it's almost like a, a, a mini open access project. We have three deals that we lovingly call the NPR model, in which... Not the WTA model. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. in, in which um, I negotiate a price for, it's, it's, there are three different databases. And then I say to my members, okay, this is the price we have to reach for all of you to have access to this. And my members then, quote unquote, bid money. It, it is fascinating. I run this program. It is fascinating to see the, the patterns of um, contributions coming from our members based on X, Y, or Z, right? So I give them downloads or I give them data usage and then I give them what they paid in the past and then I tell them what I've negotiated for an increase and I make a um, try, can you try giving this? And it's fascinating to see those bids come in because they're always lower. And I can't get mad at my libraries, right? They're trying to save money. They're trying to get everything they can for the least amount of money because their budgets are just tanking. Um, and one thing that I think we need to consider when you're talking about all of this is the 2025 enrollment bomb and um, how fundings at libraries and universities are going to get more and more difficult. So the building the case to participate in open access is going to be more and more important for all of you to help us um, as we move through um, trying to navigate this. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Amy. I think that's a wonderful place to end, just as a reminder that libraries and consortia are such an integral part of the ecosystem, even in an open access marketplace. Um, so please join me in thanking our panel and enjoy lunch. Thank you.